My name's Andrew Armitage and I'd like to uh, extend a warm welcome to everybody who's joining us this afternoon uh, on behalf of BCBC and obviously our event partners this afternoon, the East of England Energy Group, Nuclear Southwest, the Northern Nuclear Alliance, the Wales Nuclear Forum and the Northwest Nuclear Arc. I'm going to uh, hand over to uh, this afternoon's um, host who is Ruth Selleck and uh, she's got a, a brief presentation to uh, to open up. Just one point actually, the agenda has changed slightly. Uh, we are still covering exactly the same com um, content and topics, however we are going to start with uh, Tony Bondin and Neil Bailey uh, talking about the PPP supply chain, then we're going to go into Nick Golding talking about Hinkley Point C supply chain and then close with Rich Deakin on the UK SMR programme. Thank you very much, Andrew. So first of all, a very warm welcome from uh, me too to the first UK Regions online event. Um, my name's Ruth Selick. I'm a director of the Beck BC board and I'm marketing executive for Areno in the UK. It's really great to see so many people connected. So thank you again for joining us. And I hope you're looking forward to what looks like is going to be a really interesting and informative event. As I'm sure you're all aware, we're going to be hearing about major project and supply chain opportunities from across some of the UK's key clean energy regions, including the Hinkley Point supply chain, the PPP contract at Sellafield and also the UK SMR programme. But before we jump into this, um, I'd just like to give a quick bit of context to the UK regional collaboration, which is underpinning today's event. So um, just go on to the first slide then um, I'll give you a bit of an introduction. So um, the UK regional collaboration is the first multi-regional collaboration agreement within the UK energy sector. Um, it was signed on the 6th of November 2019 at Britain's Energy Coast Business Clusters Global Reach event and brought together four of the UK's clean energy regions, namely the North West, South West, Wales and East of England. Um, the agreement itself was signed by six supply chain and business cluster organisations, so Britain's Energy Coast Business Cluster, Nuclear Southwest, Northern Nuclear Reliance, Wales Nuclear Forum, East of England Energy Group and the Northwest Nuclear Arc. Um, in its essence, the agreement was designed to foster supply chain and industry collaboration within the UK's um, nuclear and clean energy regions to promote the UK's regional export capability and um, pot potential for inward investment. I think the first thing I need to point out here as well is that this collaboration is very much a starting point. Um, there is a full intention to reach out into other regions within the UK that are host to some of our clean, en clean energy installations and facilities, um, and also to position what is currently a very nuclear focused cluster within the clean energy context. So moving on to the next slide, um, I'm just giving you here a few details about the vision of the UK collaboration. Um, you can obviously read these details yourself, but in a nutshell, how I'd summarise this is in two main points. First of all, we are intending to represent the voice of regional supply chains and communities in the development and delivery of the nuclear sector deal. So making sure that local businesses and local people actually have a voice and an influence in shaping the strategic direction of the clean energy and nuclear industry. And secondly, we aim to support the prosperity and sustainability of local businesses, regional supply chains and communities in the collaborating regions. Um, so this means providing concrete opportunities for business collaboration and sharing best practice. So on to the third and, and final slide here. Um, what have we done so far to date? So, as you know, um, this is a relatively new collaboration, um, having been established at the end of last year, but we've already made some major steps in really promoting the value of regional voice within um, UK energy and nuclear industry. Some of you may have seen us at the Department for International Trade Civil Nuclear Showcase in March this year, where we ran a regional fringe event that gave um, a full picture of the entire regional landscape within civil nuclear in the UK, how to access um, technical capability um, and what existed in those regions in terms of, of assets and again technical capability within the supply chain. We've also over the past few months have been doing a lot of work behind the scenes in advocating a really strong representation of the regional voice within the nuclear sector deal agenda. So whether that is promoting place as an essential part of the nuclear sector deal delivery plan 
or indeed securing positions, regional positions within the main and shadow board nuclear industry council. So um, I hope that gives you a bit of a brief context as to what the UK regional collaboration is about. Um, I'd really urge you to stay on after the presentations to the short breakout sessions where you'll have a chance to give us some of your feedback, what you'd like to see from this collaboration, um, what you consider its value to be, and you know what, what you think is really important for us to promote through this channel. Um, so before that, I'd like to move on then to our main agenda items. Um, and I'd like to introduce our first speakers, who, as Andrew has mentioned, is um, Neil Bailey and Tony Bondin from KBR and Morgan Sindel talking about the PPP contract at Stella Field. Thank you very much, Neil and Tony. Good afternoon. Hopefully you can, you can all hear me. Uh, my name is Neil Bailey. I'm head of commercial uh, for PPP, uh, project programme and project partnership uh, delivering seven billion pounds worth of work at Sellafield that we're, we're very proud of. Um, and we've been around for a year. It's, it's a 20 year arrangement that we have with Sellafield. So thank you for uh, showing your interest in joining us this afternoon. I'll uh, spend a couple of minutes just touching on what PPP is. Uh, so not everybody who's on this call is up to speed with that. Uh, I'll take an opportunity to introduce Tony. Um, Tony's joined us very recently, uh, which we're uh, delighted with to head uh, our fairly extensive supply chain team. Uh, all of the work that we deliver will be delivered with the supply chain. Uh, the partnership isn't designed for self-delivery. The partnership is to engage with, with you guys as specialists. So it's, a, it's critical we build a really strong relationship with you. Uh, Tony will take you across his sort of six main areas that he's focusing on uh, in the short to medium term and how he's looking to develop that relationship with you and how we're looking to contract and engage with you. Uh, I'll touch on a little bit of what the program looks like, the value and the volume of that and, and where we see the peaks and troughs in the year ahead. Um, we'll, we'll close out really with um, how, how you can get in touch with us uh, and we're really looking for a successful relationship which we believe is a, a two-way two -way partnership. Um, so with that, if we could move on to the next slide, please. Okay, so Programme and Project Partners, uh, Sellafield is our client. Uh, it's a 20-year partnership, circa £7 billion worth of major projects to deliver. Um, it's fairly unique. Um, Sellafield are our client, but they are absolutely integral in, in terms of how we deliver. Um, very much a partner within, as, as well as our customer, but very, very distinct um, roles. It's a unique and fairly forward-thinking model. Uh, it is 20 years. It's a 20-year contract. It's, it's a significant commitment that is allowing us to invest significantly, uh, create a legacy, and the relationship that Sellafield has afforded uh, the four partners uh, is something that we want to cascade um, into the supply chain. So we are really looking to develop long-term relationships, long-term commitments um, with the supply chain that will support the delivery of these major projects very much for the long term. Thank you. Next slide, please. I'll, I'll touch briefly on the partners. Uh, for, for me, uh, we've been around just over a year now. Um, the partnership is more important than the individual segments. Um, but K KBR, uh, they're our integrator, uh, a whole range of professional and consult consultancy services uh, they are supporting uh, the program with. Um, Jacobs Design and Engineering focused. Uh, we have two contractors, two management contractors in, in Morgan Sindel and Doosan. Uh, Morgan Sindel identified to provide a, an infrastructure civil focus um, and Doosan uh, very much process mechanical and electrical engineering. But, but we will work together. You should expect the same behaviours uh, and engagement from all of the partnership as with the programme and project partners as opposed to forward individual segments. Thank you. At which point, uh, I'll just pass over to Tony. Thanks, Neil, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to join this session and for dialing in. Um, as Neil said, my name's Tony Bondin. I've recently joined on Monday, so third day with the PPP. Um, this slide here, I'm not going to go through it, just uh, my background is long-term KBR employee, have worked uh, a lot of previous supply chain and social impact roles in various locations. So I'm really excited to be joining PPP. 
and getting involved in, and building the relationships with all of you to make ensure that uh, PPP is a success moving forward. If we could go to the next slide, please. So Neil will talk a little bit later on the significant amount of work that is ongoing um, with PPP and how we are open for business. I think in my early days, I've, I've been fortunate to have the last couple of weeks um, being involved on the periphery with meeting Neil and some of the other team members. So you know, we're all very committed to working collaboratively and, and very open with the supply chain because we, we need to and in fact want to do that to be successful. There are several building blocks that we're currently working on. So I think my, my message is we appreciate that we can always do more, all of us, uh, no matter what our role. And we want to focus on how to improve our supply chain engagement and relationships. So at the moment, my near term workload is really around the things that you see up there. So I'm not going to cover each one in detail, but you can see we've got program procurement plan an EPMS system target operating model and program procurement manual. I'm going to be focusing on these particularly to make sure that the supply chain has the visibility so that you can see the opportunity that's coming down the pipeline. Neil will touch on a, a bit of that later on and implement things that are going to make our relationship a lot more effective to ensure that we are successful um, together on this very important project. So you'll be hearing a lot more from me um, and I'm very much looking forward to building those relationships with all of you. Um, you can contact me, Neil will explain how to get engaged, but you know, if there's anything that anyone needs in the interim, then please feel free to reach out directly. And you have my, my commitment that I will be coming back out with Neil and with others to keep you fully informed um, as to what we're doing and the various mechanisms that we can work together to ensure that transparency. And my final message is we welcome your feedback. So as we go through all this, we, we would like your feedback. If there's any guidance of things and areas for improvement, then please feel free. We are open and receptive to all of that to ensure that this is a successful program. So with that, I'll hand back to Neil, who will run through some of the current opportunities and, and what the future, the near term future looks like. And once again, thank you very much for the opportunity to meet with you all today. Okay. Next slide then, please. Thank you, Tony. So, so where, where, where are we? Uh, this is a slide that we established quite early on. Um, last year uh, when we were looking at the programme and the peak that, that is ahead of us. Um, tells us two things really, we, we've got an awful lot to do but it also quite clearly puts into context that, that we've only just started but, but even that only just started uh, is significant. In, in, in the first year we've, we've placed around £100 million worth of contracts, a mixture of short and long term um, commitments into the supply chain uh, and, and we're currently working on, on a similar value. Uh, there that we expect to place be before Christmas this year. Um, and I think if we move on to the next slide, please. There, so this, this one isn't as clear, um, but the, what, what, what this indicates is that we, we, we still have significant volumes that we are committed to this year, next year, and the year after. We, we the commitments are, are intense. Um, we, we need the engagement with the supply chain, hence the work that Tony will be doing to do that to ensure this is effective. And I, and I think the key piece that we reflect on is it's been a hell of a year for all of us in terms of COVID and six months. Uh, we, we are reflecting, although the future is slightly uncertain, uh, but we're still open for business. We've had very little disruption uh, in, in terms of what we've been looking to do. Uh, we've got our projects remobilized on site. Uh, we have three projects, uh, which I'll describe as the, the RAP project, which is a, 
a multi hundred million pounds analytical facility. We have an SRP project. Um, SRP is circa a, a billion pounds um, factory in, in its simplest form. And we have the SCP project, which is just coming out of the ground as well. Again, it's many hundreds of millions of pounds of investments um, there are, and effectively a process plant that we are delivering as partnerships. So these projects are live and we have a number which are still very much in their early days of the design phase, which have also started as well. So uh, we're fortunate COVID hasn't impacted. We are open for business. Hence, um, Tony will be very much in touch with you, with you guys and we're looking for that, that two-way dialogue. Next slide, please. Okay, so, so we do have some transactional activity. Uh, we do have three major projects that we are still delivering. Um, but the relationship that we're looking for with the supply chain is long term. I, I mentioned that earlier on. And we're looking for frameworks uh, to, to engage in long term contracts with, uh, with the specialists to support us. Uh, and, and, a, and a big part of that is, is ECI, early contractor involvement. Um, and this means an awful lot more to us and the partnership than perhaps can you come along to a meeting and have a chat? We, we want to engage with you through, through these long term relationships where you become part of our team. You are part of the delivery team, something that we call an aligned delivery team. Um, so we, we have significant facility buildings coming out of the ground um, there and, and we want to select partners who are able to help us design those facilities and get the buildability right at the earliest point. So concrete structures, steel structures as well, um, along to scaffolding and access arrangements, a partnership there uh, that will work direct for the partnerships, but will also engage and interface uh, into all tiers of the supply chain um, there to be able to support us. Uh, we, there's, there's, there's room in here as well, not just for big tier one contractors. Uh, we need to cascade this down the supply chain. So we're, we're looking for smaller partners as well who, who can help set up facilities and help do the enabling works to help us deliver projects as well. That's our civils, civils package there. Um, the whole MEC electrical package is significant. Uh, many billions of pounds worth of work there. Uh, and, we're, and we're looking for some a good, good range of tier of partners there in the whole electrical instrumentation and HAVAC wheels. Uh, there's probably not in the field much for probably around 18 months, but, but we want you guys on board now uh, to help us uh, to make sure that the solutions that we've designed are buildable um, and you're on board at the first opportunity. Site accommodation, it, it's not probably around 20 million pound over the first five years, but fairly significant that we're, we're looking for a partner who is able to respond and react uh, and help deliver what, what we need to deliver these projects there. Um, and from a technical aspect, as I said, I mentioned, we've got a lot of other projects coming up uh, and we need some help there in the technical field uh, to ensure that we select the right sites and we know what we need to do with those sites before we even contemplate uh, sticking a bucket in them. So um, there for our next 12 months, four, eight significant partners, uh, partnerships that we're looking for there with a, with a number of tier of uh, partners from the supply chain. Um, and part of the development of that structure that we expect to get from dialogue uh, and early engagements with the supply chain to perhaps you understand what works for you as well as what we think works for us. Next slide, please. Okay, so coming to our end of our 10 minutes, if not, not run over, um, you, you will be getting this, you heard earlier on, so please don't rush to um, write that down. Um, contact details there straight to Tony. Our, our commitment is if you get in touch with us, we will get back to you. If we haven't done that in the past, uh, we have leadership there in Tony, which we have a huge degree of confidence in. Uh, but please, please make yourself known. We're looking for relationships, which is two-way. Um, we'll pull. Please push us. Uh, we, we want to get this right. We're, we're here for another 19 years, and we've got a, a significant work, work stream that we need to deliver. Um, so for me, some key messages. Um, this is different. Sellerfield have put a whole amount of confidence in the supply chain uh, to support the delivery of these major projects. It's a different risk model. Um, in, in terms of very much risk will sit in the right place where it is best managed, uh, as, as with opportunity as well. Uh, we're happy to reward success. Success for us, though, is successful outcomes of projects. Uh, that, that, that's very much what we're looking for there. Uh, we're open for business, very much open for business, effective relationships. And as I say, please remember, we want a two-way relationship in this. So thank you very much for your time and for joining us. And we hope you found that of, of interest. Andrew or Ruth, back to you.
Okay, thank you, uh, thank you both for that presentation. Uh, like I say, those share, those uh, slides will obviously be captured in the uh, the recording, and uh, and circulated. Um, we have a couple of questions. Um, so the first question comes from uh, Michelle Edmondson. Michelle, do you want to put your question? I have it in front of me. It was pre-submitted, so I have it in front of me. But I can see you've unmuted yourself. So uh, <laughs> perhaps you want to able you want to to put that question directly to uh, to the speakers. Yeah, that's fine. Thanks, Andrew. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I should say I've got a vested interest in that I'm currently intelligent client for PPP for Sellafield, but I am moving to our strategic sourcing team at Sellafield. So what I really wanted to ask was, and this applies to PPP as much as it applies to other speakers and the BEC cluster as a whole, but as a client, how can we understand the supply chain more? And that includes our alliance and partners, our more traditional contractor relationships, tier twos, SMEs. I've been thinking a lot lately about the psychological contract, what we think we know, what we think the supply chain understand, what we want them to understand, and equally the sorts of information we share. So if it was one specific question, what, what would you most want the client to understand better about the supply chain? Tony? Um, so thanks for the question, Michelle. Um, I think around expectations and capability, um, really understanding the value that can be brought and to make sure that we are fully aligned in that respect. It's, it's very difficult, as you say, there's multi facets to what the supply chain necessarily thinks we're looking for. So to try and boil it down, I mean, it's, it's communication. And that's why I really want to focus on a communication plan and to get IC's thoughts on this. so that we can very much get benefits from both sides. As Neil said, it's two way, pull and push. And that's where I see the communication plan coming together. And that, that I, will, I don't believe needs to be done. Okay, it looks like we might have lost Tony there. I think so. So um, I, I think Tony was getting his messaging across. I think we, we're quite fortunate on PP, Michelle, that we do have Sellafields. Uh, within the partnership as well as IC so and, and we do recognize the distinct roles so um, I think whilst Tony is encouraging real open uh, collaboration and communication between the partners um, and, and the next tier of the supply chain um, I, I think if we've got that as well between the partnership um, and the clients and the customer uh, and we, we can create that triangle then very much the, the sweet spot is very much in the middle so um, alignment and understanding of priorities um, is, is important to us all. Sorry for that, Neil. I just dropped off. <laughs> is that okay, Michelle? Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Thank you. And I'm also interested to hear from some of perhaps the SMEs here. Um, sometimes we ask for things and then when they provide it, we say, no, we didn't mean that. We meant something else. So I think there's quite a big piece in working with our supply chain and, and how we're a lot clearer with our requirements. And when we ask for innovation and when we get given innovation, that we actually appreciate it. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Uh, there is just one question popped up very quickly. I was about to close it and move on, but we have uh, Stephen Shepherd. Uh, you've just posted a question in the chat. Do you want to? You've unmuted yourself, I think. Yes, over yeah. to you, Stephen. Just a, just a quick one, really. On the expressions of interest that we get from uh, Morgan Sindel, we could just do it a little bit more detail or a picture or a photograph or a basic drawing so that we don't waste time in uh, saying, yes, we're interested in making a proposal when we don't know exactly what it is. For instance, shield doors, is it an up and, is it an up and over roll, a shutter door, or is it an actual fabrication? You can't tell from the wording. It's only uh, two or three lines. Okay. I thought you were going to ask for a picture of me then, Tony, <laughs> Stephen. So, uh, All right. Uh, no. no, okay. Um, Tony mentioned there, two-way feedback. If, if, if we are not articulating what you need, um, we'll thank, thank you for the feedback. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll we don't want to waste your time. That's the answer, really. We don't want to waste your time and say, look, we're interested in that. And then when we actually see it, it it's made from concrete or whatever, you know. Okay, so. Part, part of, Tony. Yeah, yeah, just thank you, Stephen, for the, for the feedback. That's something for us to take away and uh, 
yeah. as I say, two-way street. So it's it's positive to hear things like this. So thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you, um, Neil and Tony. Thank you, both of you. Thank you for those uh, couple of questions as well. Uh, we will move on. And uh, next up, next on the agenda, uh, we have Nick Golding, who is going to be talking about the Hinkley Point C supply chain. For those of you that don't know me, my name's Nick Golding. Uh, I'm here today representing Nuclear Southwest and also the Hinkley supply chain team. Um, I'm here to talk to you about the opportunities through the Hinkley supply chain program. The Hinkley Supply Chain Program was commissioned in 2017 to help regional businesses overcome some of the primary challenges of breaking into the nuclear sector for the first time. It was coordinated by the Heart of the Southwest LEP and bringing in the West of England Combined Authority and Welsh Government to try and put support in place to help firms understand, engage and capitalise on the opportunities of the Hinkley Point C project and to leverage this experience into other nuclear market segments and other low carbon renewable technologies. The programme is supported by EDF Energy and we work very closely with them as part of the team uh, and is delivered by a consortium of companies made up of uh, SRAMAS, which is a company I work for, Somerset Chamber of Commerce and Business West. Ultimately, the aim of the, the programme is to provide the necessary support to regional firms and international investors to create the UK's first next generation nuclear cluster here in the southwest of England. And we're trying to do that by bringing together aspects of knowledge transfer, skill support, innovation support, funding and finance. And the aim of it is to create a collaborative and attractive environment for businesses to connect with nuclear new build and specifically around some of the, the strengths that we're now building in the southwest around EPR technologies. The aim of the team is really to help grow the southwest and south Wales supply chain for Hinkley Point C supply content through providing high quality supply sourcing for the main contractors, helping those firms across the region um, in terms of readiness and competitiveness based on that uh, contractor feedback, doing our best to facilitate visibility of opportunities and matching companies towards that, and helping to build transferable capability from using HPC as an initial project into the other markets and opportunities um, across the area. The programme itself provides value for money, but it is public sector funding from the, the regions that I've mentioned. And the way we work is that there's about uh, a third, third, third model, where a third of the money is invested from the public, a third of the money is through private sector investment, largely from EDF Energy and from contributions that are made through Somerset Energy Innovation Centre, and also a third of the money is benefit in kind, um, provided from the SMEs and the companies we're working with to try and help get them ready. What's been achieved so far? Well, the proof's always in the pudding. And so far, companies supported through the programme have won more than £400 million in terms of contracts with the HPC area. We've run more than 170 workshops, um, which have been held helping 127 companies and more now gain new knowledge and achieve new standards. Those standards around things like nuclear safety culture, counterfeit fraud and suspect items, as well as certifications such as ISO 9001. The feedback we get from customers is used to tailor those workshops and support to try and help address the capability gaps and needs that, that are being fed back from contractors and partners within the programme. More than a thousand companies have been put forward to, uh, to contractors where we match them with their capability and the companies have been promoted more than seven and a half thousand times. So it's fairly clear that there's been a number of companies that have been put forward on multiple occasions based on that capability. The opportunities itself, though, in the Southwest are fairly significant. There's been a number of reports which have been commissioned to establish the scale of the nuclear opportunity in the Southwest of England. We've had reports by Davis Nuclear Associates and Fraser Nash have identified more than £50 billion worth of future spend on regional infrastructure projects. That's split across nuclear new build, decommissioning, defence, as well as existing fleet maintenance. And we've got some fantastic work currently going on with Southwest, Southwest Nuclear Hub, trying to help engage on nuclear fusion programs and other opportunities in addition to this, which could potentially increase this even further. Based on the work which we've been carried out, we estimate that this represents at least a £15 billion addressable market opportunity within the region for companies um, across the UK. 
interestingly, we've done a range of work around this to try and understand where are the capability gaps that we're seeing. And in the UK, we have developers, you know, we've got EDF Energy headquartered in the southwest in Gloucestershire. Um, and with there are some exceptions to all of these, but by and large, we see we've got really strong capability and great opportunities for firms across the areas in blue. Where we start to see a slight challenge from doing the work we've been doing for the last three, four years is around the tier two suppliers and modules and systems. And this is not this gap isn't really caused by capability that we have within the UK. It's often caused by financial liabilities associated with the size of the contracts rather than the actual lack of capability for firms across the UK. Uh, but uh, we believe there's an opportunity that collectively we may be able to work together together across the regions to be able to solve this. And if we can solve this challenge, we believe there's a greater potential for all of the UK firms to, to build UK nuclear capability that will support not just the Hinkley Point C project, but also other nuclear projects across, across the country. The latest EDF socioeconomic reports highlights that more than 64% of the contracts by value have got from HPC have been awarded to UK firms. EDF have published their contracts on the website and if you need any information on that, please feel free to contact me and I'll happily send that through to you so you can find that after this presentation. This chart shows the, minimum, the breakdown of contract value by, com by country based on the minimum contract values. Some of the mechanical, electrical and HVAC systems contracts are likely to be significantly greater than these uh, minimum values. And this represents one of the areas that we're looking to focus on for UK and regional firms moving forward. The opportunities so far with HPC have still largely been around associated developments, infrastructure in the regional area and civil engineering. We've had lots of steel fabrications and lots of earth moving equipment, but it's only now that we're starting to move into this mechanical, electrical and HVAC phase that more significant opportunities are coming forward. The future opportunities that we see are not going to be found directly with EDF Energy, but within their tier one and tier two supply chain. The tier one companies are publicly shown on the EDF Energy website. Um, and I would encourage all firms across the UK to try and have a look at that website to see who within their existing customer base is connected within the project as a key route to try and connect into it and try and see what you can do to, to get involved with the programme. The future of this is around mechanical, electrical and HVAC systems. There are huge numbers across every single category on this project and there's going to be, but there is effort needed now from all the firms across the UK and particularly regional firms to engage on that area and continue to maintain any engagement that's already been put in place. The programme itself is a, is a very large project and with all of these things, timings change and um, opportunities can be lost by not maintaining customer contact throughout that, that long period of time between potential initial engagement and when the opportunity will actually arise. There are some common challenges for firms. It's, it's fair to say that out of the firms that are involved in the project, it's probably only going to be the top 10 to 20% of firms that are really competitive that will be able to be selected and move forward with the, 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 the contracts that are available. Uh, nuclear always asks for the best of the firms and they will make no sort of exemption for that. So we've got to be competitive, we've got to be capable and we've got to be able to show that we have the right connections and the right approach to these customer opportunities. There are plenty of opportunities for firms to collaborate. Quali qualification costs and programme volumes are a key challenge for many firms. One of the ways we're looking at overcoming some of these areas is by work, getting firms to work together to understand where those qualification costs lie and how can we leverage those um, products and services that are being qualified, not just into the HPC program, but into other markets. By doing this, it allows firms to amortize costs over a much wider area and also creates opportunities in the longer term. There are some advantages that UK firms have as well. The differences in approach uh, to regulation through the Office of Nuclear Regulation and, their, and particularly around their non-specific approach is uncomfortable for many international firms but allows UK firms an opportunity to compete because we've got a very strong engineering base and an engineering approach in, in this country for a, range of these, um, the, for a range of these opportunities. 
There is some specific UK specific legislation, such as the CDM regulations, which UK firms have knowledge of and can be able to capitalise in and potentially compete against international firms around that. That said, we believe that the best way forward is through collaboration with both uh, UK firms and international teams to try and bring together um, existing qualifications and um, opportunities through, through the various programmes. Nuclear is special. It is only going to be for the best supplies. Um, and our role is really to try and help companies understand what that looks like and get them there before the opportunity arises. We try to work 18 months to 24 months ahead of the, the opportunities being available. And that can create some challenges in terms of transparency. Um, but we are doing everything we can to put firms forward and give them the support that they need around safety, quality, leadership, um, and also competitiveness to be able to put themselves in the right position to be able to compete, as well as challenging companies um, who are already contractors in the supply chain as to why, UK, why the UK may be competitive. And we'll look to do that through uh, addressing challenges around transportation issues, potentially damage issues that could have come up, as well as trying to put forward um, advantages of uh, local support as well. So I guess from my perspective, there's a couple of key messages. Um, the Southwest as a whole is a region, and I'd include South Wales within that as well, has significant opportunities for growth um, and is a great area to, to have a look at. Um, in terms of the place agenda, we, we fully recognise that the Northwest is recognised as one of the key areas, but the Southwest also has a number of opportunities and some very significant capability that we're looking to build on. We're only about four years into the HPC project, with the, the first unit still aiming to be completed by 2025. So that means over the next five years, there's a huge challenge ahead and it's going to need everybody's help to work together to be able to make that a success. The, the large opportunities are still, there are large opportunities which are still to come, but it's not going to be directly through EDF Energy, but through the many tier one and tier two companies. And that's where we see we, uh, we can play a role in helping firms to, to engage with them and to, to try and capitalise on that. A lot of the strategic opportunities that will help build a legacy and capability that's applicable across all nuclear market segments um, will fall beyond 2020. And that's the area of focus, uh, particularly around the, the mechanical, electrical and HVAC systems. And we believe there are further opportunities to leverage the new build experience into the new EPR fleet maintenance programmes for UK firms that get involved now. And I think that's it from me. All right. Thank you, Nick. Um, if there are any questions, uh, please do post, post them in the chat. Uh, I have one quick question, uh, which I will put to you directly. It was pre-submitted again. Uh, we are interested in any opportunities at HPC being a previous supplier and thus are wondering if previous suppliers are automatically given the opportunity to tender or if we should join the supply chain portal for Hinkley Point C. Are the supply chain data banks shared between Hinkley and Sizewell as the end client is the same? Okay, I think the first point around um, existing suppliers, are they automatically given opportunities? I think it, the, a lot of this procurement is done on a customer by customer basis. So all I can say is I would expect uh, the company to have a, a very strong chance of being considered, but I wouldn't rely on that. In the same way that the PPP team were just talking about push and pull, if you've got that experience, I'd be pushing as hard as I can to the customer to try and make sure you're still involved with the project. On the second part of it, around the databases, uh, I would still encourage all, all firms to register on any relevant databases to try and increase their visibility, regardless of, of that experience. Being promoted more times than, than not is not is no bad thing in this current climate because it gives you more chances of, and opportunities to be able to connect. Um, and then finally, I think the question was around, do some of the databases connect together? And they do. Um, they are run by regional teams, but ultimately they're connected into EDF Energy. So there is a view that regardless of which of these systems you um, register onto, if that capability is needed, it will ultimately feed its way into to EDF to try and connect you into the opportunities available. All right, Nick, thank you. Um, Peter Fleming, you have uh, posted a question in the chat. Um, perhaps you'd like to put that question directly to, uh, to Nick. So, afternoon, everybody. I'm, I'm Peter Fleming. Um, whilst I run my own business consultancy, I'm a director of British Energy Coast Business Cluster and pick up the, the co-lead on the SME agenda. 
And Nick, really be, be interesting, and this can go wider to the other speakers as well. Um, but we speak a lot about collaboration and opportunities for SMEs. However, what, what support do you offer through your procurement programs to create an engaging environment for SMEs to work successfully together, um, whether that's with some of these future opportunities, but also to particularly engage with the extended supply chain? So have you got any specific examples where you've supported SMEs? Yeah, we've, we've created a number of SME collaborative groups which have gone on to form their own companies on the back of this. And we've got some that are still working through uh, potential opportunities as well. What we, would try, what we do through the programme is we try and identify a significant enough opportunity that justifies bringing together um, that group. Because the key challenge is that uh, you know, collaboration is hard. Uh, it's not the easy option, if we're honest about it. It is much easier to try and go at these things alone. But there needs to be a reason for collaboration and the size and scale of the opportunity needs to be significant enough. Where we can see those types of opportunities and the, the, the situation would be that an SME group would potentially be prevented from accessing it, we try and bring them together with a relevant partner to overcome whether it be financial or uh, capability gaps to go forward with it. We've done that on metal fabrications. Um, we've done that on some of the associated site services as well. And some of those companies have been uh, very successful. It's not about funding, really. It's about creating, sort of supplying the, the manpower and the expertise to actually make these things happen, yeah. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's as much about acting as the catalyst to bring them together with, the, with understanding the opportunity as it is about any funding that's available to be able to do that. Great. And if, if we wanted to access any information about how these work, is, this, is there somewhere we can go to? Yeah, I, th I think we're looking, I think it's worth saying we are looking to try and extend this region uh, from just being solely based in the southwest to a, a national platform in conjunction with nuclear AMRC as part of a nuclear sector deal proposal. So I think in terms of where you can access this going forward, I'm hopeful and I have my fingers crossed and everything else that potentially going forward, there'd be a, a much easier way um, for all companies on this call to be able to access that level of support um, through a combined national programme. Okay, thank, thanks, Nick. Thanks for your insight. Uh, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Nick. Uh, no further questions. So uh, we will move on to our final speaker of the afternoon, and that is Rich Deakin of the UK SMR programme. Good afternoon, everybody. So um, I'll quickly introduce myself. I just been scanning the participants list as we've been going through this, so I'm sure many people on the call know me. Um, but for those that don't, um, I joined um, UKRI as the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund Low Cost Nuclear Challenge Director in April of this year. So relatively recently, um, prior to that, I sat in central government in um, the Nuclear Directorate within Bayes, and for the last two and a half years, very central to my portfolio of developing policies, um, SAT, small and advanced nuclear. Um, so I've now gone, if you like, from the policy directorate into the delivery arm um, of UK Gov. Next slide, please, Andy. So what I'm going to talk about, actually, a, a kind of um, Five, five themes, really. First of all, I'll give you a little scamper through what ISCF is, um, what it's meant to do. I'll then talk about the product that is the UK SMR. I'll talk about the consortium partners, who's currently involved, um, the timelines for how this may evolve going forward, which are relatively short in nuclear space, um, and the vision and benefits, and to some extent, the scale of the ambition of the UK SMR program. And then I'll close with questions. And of course, I, I think I said to everybody in the chat room, please, please have questions because, um, again, for people that know me, I like to be quite interactive and um, I will be as, as open and honest um, in terms of what I can tell you at this point in time as I possibly can be. Yeah. So um, just to position everything in, in people's minds, what is the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund and where do UKRI sit? Well, right at the top of the agenda, uh, there'll be a number of people on the call, maybe less so on this call, that will recognize something called Target 2.4, um, which is an ambition um, to generate um, or to, to be able to have an impact on the UK's proportion of GDP that's placed into R&D expenditure that increases from a current 1.7% to 2.4%. Yeah. UKRI is very central to the heart of that plan. 
So essentially, UKRI brings together the um, academic end of the project pipeline, um, which looks at very early technologies and kind of innovation. It brings together the catapults and the innovation centers such as nuclear AMRC, and I recognize one or two guys on the call from here. And it also then moves into, well, having done the early research, having done the early development, and then what comes next? Well, what comes next is co-funding and commercialization and deployment of first of a kind. Yeah? ISCF, the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund, very much sits as the driver for commercialization of innovation in the UK and in the industrial strategy. So we co-fund and co-match um, a lot of major infrastructure programs and a lot of innovation projects. So um, there's some scalar numbers on there. Yeah, um, kind of interesting because it's very big um, and we are making the investments um, to address the biggest in, of uh, both industry and society challenges today. <clears throat> These are known as the grand challenges and um, you know clean growth and climate change and how we will grow the economy um, for the benefit of the UK um, by anybody's estimation at the moment and understanding are a major societal challenge going forward. Low cost nuclear um, is um, a program within the clean growth portfolio within um, in the industrial strategy challenge portfolio. It's 235 million so I'm the program director for the 235 million. Um, and it is more than much funded by industry should it go forward. So this program over the next four years, circa four to four and a half years, will potentially spend 500 million in the UK, predominantly in the UK, um, in progressing a UK product that can support clean growth by delivering low carbon energy through uh, nuclear. Next slide, please. So really key word here for everybody on the call, and I say this at every, every conversation I have, and believe me, I have many, many conversations at the moment that are very active around the future SMR program. Um, it's not a project, it is a product. Yeah? And it is a, um, it's an enabler to develop all the infrastructure and the capability that the UK needs to deliver a small modular reactor product. So what is the product? Um, the current baseline is a 440 megawatt output unit. Um, interestingly, most small reactors um, in near-term pressurized water space or the most current rel relative technologies uh, that are out there are circa 2 billion for a first of a kind. Um, it's intended and won't go forward unless it can be demonstrated to deliver um, highly competitive energy on a levelized cost of electricity basis. Um, and of course, there will be um, employment both on and off site um, engaged in delivering these units. Yeah. I'll just comment on compact design. Um, small modular reactors, while smaller than, uh, for example, Hinkley C in terms of output, are not that small, but they are very modular. Um, so if you can envisage a um, an area that would fit roughly under the size of the O2 arena, um, a small modular reactor plant such as this would sit under the O2 arena. Um, they will generate power through a 60 year life, um, which of course is very important. Um, and the intent is to have a single technology licensing arrangement in terms of GDA that can then allow faster deployments on a fleet basis. Yeah. Important pictures on the bottom, um, factory built and tested um, for the observant um, that's an isofreight container um, frame. So a lot of these modules will be built in standardized production lines um, and then assembled at site. Assembly will be under an on-site canopy, um, which protects both against environmental conditions, um, but actually allows some uh, standard manufacturing processes to be deployed. For example, robotic assembly, um, advanced welding, joining techniques, um, NDA, X-ray, that kind of stuff, yeah. And the one that's really central to this, um, and again, a statement to make at many conversations, this is intended to be designed once and deployed in many, many areas and many units. Yeah. Um, it will be built on a seismic raft that will isolate it from ground conditions. The seismic raft may need some um, local attenuation 
to fit for ground conditions, but it will be a, a multi-deployment standard design. And for people who understand the cost drivers in nuclear, that's very beneficial. Next slide, please, Andy. So talking around um, who's currently engaged, um, the LCN phase one consortium um, essentially consists of the companies you can see on the slide, and I won't go through all those. Um, what I will linger on just a second um, is the list of areas ongoing um, in terms of design work currently um, and cost analysis currently um, that sit on the right hand side of this slide. And the key point on there is um, it's not about the technology. It's not just about the reactor island. Um, of those 11 areas listed on the right-hand side, um, what should be apparent is that potentially um, there's not that much nuclear. A lot of this is essentially good engineering, manufacturing, um, and compilation of features, components, design, front to back. This program is designed to um, lead towards a capability to deliver a power station. It is not a technology development program. Okay. Next slide, Andy. Um, timelines, because I'm sure lots of people will be interested in timelines on this call um, and when they may see um, external activity on this. Well, I've already said we're currently in phase one. Um, that was, uh, it actually says initiated in 2018. Um, the initiation in 2018 was the UK consortia um, backed by many, many um, industry and academic bodies um, bidding into the clean growth challenge in UKRI in early 2018. The project actually initiated with a first award of grant funding in um, November last year. So we're in relatively early stages, but we are progressing through phase one at quite a pace, um, which means that should it go forward um, and phase one um, be shown to be delivering the anticipated trajectory towards a low cost development, um, phase two would initiate um, and be ongoing on the timelines you can see there. That program is based on um, the program that I'm currently building within UKRI um, in terms of funding, scheduling, um, and engagement with stakeholders and consortia partners. Um, and you can see that actually, whilst you see the headlines there, there's quite a lot of detail, as you can imagine, underpins that. Um, ultimately, the low-cost nuclear challenge's aim is to attract commercial investment and to enable deployment, um, commencing with the first project, first of a kind project, circa 2025 and have a unit on grid commercially available by 2030. And just before we move to the next slide, as people linger on that, you will see elements in there of supply chain, you'll see elements in there of um, managing GDA, you'll see elements in there of regulatory capability and factory productivity. It's a very broad portfolio of activity um, that will be associated with this project. Next slide, Andy. Yeah. So here I'm going to talk a little bit about the benefits. And um, these are the basis of the um, estimates and the numbers are on here in public domain. Um, but I'll cluster them broadly. Um, well, first of all, uh, climate change. Um, these things will take around, well, will take huge amounts of CO2 um, off the grid. Um, they currently operate at 12, well, the current baseline assumption is something circa um, 12 grams of CO2 per megawatt hour, uh, which is very, very um, beneficial to the UK energy um, generation mix in terms of reducing carbon. Um, they will be cost competitive or they will not go forward. There will have to be a demonstrated analysis that says there's a net benefit in energy reduction. That's good. Um, they will provide factories in the regions. It will be a UK supply chain. The real scale of ambition is to reinvigorate the UK nuclear industry. And there's a passing nod there um, to future pathways to net zero in advanced nuclear and AMR space. Next slide, Andy. Ah, that's good. Okay. Um, the circa 80,000 people work in the sector currently. Um, this program 
if it goes forward and it will not go forward on a single project basis it will go forward with an intent to deploy enough smrs to realize fleet benefit and to warrant establishing a supply chain and, and manufacturing infrastructure um, will increase or could increase at its peak um, up to 40,000 jobs in the UK and they will be in high value manufacturing and engineering. Um, there's just a, an indicative diagram with a, an apology to my colleagues from the Southwest. I'm sure there are, and I know there are potential sites for SMRs and that could be made available in the Southwest and beyond. And last slide, on it to last slide. So huge, so if, if people ask me, um, Will these things go forward? Um, and I get asked that again very, very often. Um, they are hugely beneficial to carbon um, reduction in, in the whole economy. Um, they will provide um, economic stimulus in the regions in a post COVID era. They will provide high value manufacturing and engineering jobs. They will provide low cost power for a long time. And that's premised on standard designs, precision engineering, production lines, etc. Yeah. And very last slide. Questions. Um, this is a new challenge. Not many people understand where the ISCF sits within the uh, UK's toolbox for generating co-investment and regional development and economic stimulus. Um, please look at our website, that will be updated shortly. Um, and by all means, um, send direct contact questions um, as an email address on there for my very, very uh, fabulous PA, and we'll pick those up and we will get back to you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Rich. Uh, we do have one question just at the moment. Um, Ian Ray, you have uh, put a question in the chat. I don't know if you want to unmute yourself and ask that to Rich. Hi, Richard. How are you doing? Hey, Ian. Awesome. Uh, just um, probably an obvious question. Where does site selection fit in? Yeah. Um, well, the obvious, most, most um, nuclear deployments, Ian, um, are kind of operating in a sequential basis where they're going, well, we'll design the thing, we'll license the thing. Um, and the licensing currently includes the G, well, the, the steps into the licensing and the GDA, which talks, kind of brings together um, assessment of the technology and assessment of the site. Yeah. So if you look at the timeline I put up on there, um, which said that we would be moving towards the end of GDA, I think um, in something like three years time, site selection would be ahead of that because they'll be starting to move to into things like consent to construct. Yeah. Now then the question is, can that be accelerated? Possibly. Yeah. Um, that would need a bigger commitment from UK Gov um, than is currently outlined, but it could happen. Uh, there may be some ambition on that. Uh, front and I'm being asked questions um, around that possibility um, in central government and other places whether that happens or not we'll see um, hopefully that answers one point I skipped over there because I was mindful of time the GDA guidance from the ONR was updated on their website in October of last year sorry of October of uh, uh, yeah 19 um, the whole point of that was to to some extent um, separate the technology assessment from the assessment of the operator and the site yeah and that's very central to the premise of design once deploy many times you want an assessment of the technology and then fit it to the site operations because as people on this call will know I'm sure a site license is really predicated by the operator and the capability to operate and maintain the hazards and control on the site I guess where I was coming from is that and uh, just to be honest, I spent three years with NewGen before its uh, unfortunate yep. demise, and yep. um, I, I was always very confident that we could deploy the technology, uh, but actually fitting it in a space in West Cumbria brought many, many, many challenges, um, probably yep. far greater than actually getting the technology deployed. <laughs> yeah. Um... So there are, there are colleagues on the call from North Wales. So, I, so there are 
Um, studies out there on siting, I think which are in public domain from the Energy Technology Institute, but I'm pretty sure they are, but they're, they're a little dated now, around circa 2015, 16, maybe 14. Um, I think there are many sites here that are technically capable of hosting an SMR, um, including um, Moorside, um, and including Trous Finid, and including several other of the NDA owned sites, for example. Um, that being said, the sensible way to approach this would be to go to the NDA sites or the sites that are predominantly in government control, because they would be the easiest ones to access and go through that process, um, not least of all from a confidence building point of view. Um, and interestingly, and also very helpfully, those sites are in regions that, you know, if we're candidate, we all understand need need the stimulus, need help. So that's good. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Richard. Much appreciated. Yes, yeah. Uh, thank you. We have a just a couple of more questions before we go into the breakout rooms. Um, just for sake of time, uh, from Martin Lawrence, would the consortia interested uh, be interested in a UK-based turbine supplier? Um, so, so what, one of the things that's been quite difficult on this, um, again, to people on the call is they'll say, well, we've, we've not been able to access this. It seems to have been a bit of a closed shop to the consortium. Um, now, essentially, that's been, I, I think, for very good reputational reasons of some of the players in there. Um, they don't want to excite and stimulate the supply chain before they're confident this will go forward. Um, so I think the answer is potentially yes. Um, I would anticipate that they would be looking towards um, supplier events within fairly short order, fairly short order, um, once they're confident. Um, predicated on our match funding of this will be a, a need to drive investment through the UK. I mean, we're not, we're not doing this um, to take major items offshore. There will be some that we currently don't have capability to deliver, but um, if they can match the specification and the competitive, yes. And that, I think, would come forward through next year if this goes forward, yeah. All right. Thank you, Rich. And final question, again, I'll ask just for purpose of time. It's from Ivan Baldwin, and uh, he's asking, being in a global supply chain is clearly a big prize. What, if any, is the latest thinking on factory locations? Okay. So a little bit on timing. Um, to hit the time skills, we, so I'll start with timing and then I'll start with potential locations. Yeah. Um, this is a, um, a product that needs engineering and manufacturing skills that fit very well across the north, northern arc of the UK and construction skills that are being demonstrated and practiced in the southwest at the moment, for instance. Yeah. Um, in terms, so, so you could expect um, factory locations to be positioned in the northwest nuclear arc broadly. Um, which includes North Wales and um, Liverpool, Manchester, Sheffield, Derby, uh, and potentially Cumbria. Yeah. Um, so you could almost think of this as the site being a factory, because I tried to make the point that the site is under a canopy. And by the way, the canopy is reusable. It's modular. <laughs> so somebody will have to design and build that. And I think that would fit very well with some of the skills, for example, upon the North Northwest Nuclear Coast yeah, and some of the engineering companies there. Um, there will be something around primary components and the reactor island stuff, um, componentry, heavy metals, uh, heavy metal uh, forgings and fabrications. You might well expect that to be, well, you'll know where that will be because you'll understand the UK supply chain on this call. Um, there'll be things in there around um, E, I, and C, which I think could be more flexible locations. Um, and there'll be things in there around potentially export points. Um, a global market is a, is a huge prize here, and the numbers that I quoted in the slide, and you'll see on the slides, um, in my view, are relatively conservative because we don't want to overstimulate it, but there are lots of public studies around this thing. Yeah. That means you need an export port. Yeah. So there's, a, there's another facility. So this is not about a single site build. This is about several factory units and dispersed supply chain across the north. Hopefully that helps... Um, Ivan's question, and who's taking it forward? Um, what we got there from Jamie? Okay. Um, Jamie's asking me a question in the chat room around who's driving international regulation um, and standards of. Um, 
Well, what I would point you towards there is um, that needs to be driven through essentially Bayes and the regulators. There's lots of collaborative forums where the regulators currently meet. Um, I think, uh, I believe, um, a UK-Canada um, joint collaboration agreement and collaboration plan was uh, publicly announced at the DIT Civil Nuclear Showcase this year. Um, I would look towards that yeah, as a vehicle for... Um, increased collaboration. Collaboration is an interesting word. It only really works if you've actually got an agreement that you've got a common objective and the objective has to be focused towards reducing the cost of regulation and standardization. So I think uh, in the first instance, I'd look towards collaborative announcements between governments at various forums. I think there's one as well as DIT, Civil Nuclear. I, I'm so going to that final, John, final what, last one, John. There from John, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, there will be some cranies, John. I, I, can't, I I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not the technical design authority on this. Um, actually, that's interestingly dispersed across the consortium partners with roles as the integrator currently. Um, the limit of my knowledge, I would say, I've seen very, 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 very fancy videos showing both small cranes and large cranes operating under that canopy, and lots of them. <laughs> yeah, so I think there will be um, traditional lifting, but I would think of it more in a factory context rather than megaliths, if that makes sense. The canopy is a factory. All right. Okay. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, everybody, for those questions. Now, we have a, uh, a breakout session now, which I'm going to invite everybody to. Uh, the rooms have all been pre-allocated, so this should go swimmingly well. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Uh, there is a facilitator in each of the, uh, the groups, and the question for the group discussion is, how can we use this multi-regional agreement to increase opportunities for collaboration, promote the UK's technical capability within the energy sector, and attract inward investment. Um, now, I don't know what it is, when, whether it's the word breakout rooms, it puts the fear in people, or whether we are just running uh, to time and, and people have other events to go to, but the numbers have dropped. Um, so let me just recreate some of those rooms and make sure that we haven't got any that are particularly small. So we've got groups between uh, six and 10 people, uh, and I'm gonna set this for, uh, for 14 minutes with a 60 second cool down. So, uh, so after the breakout sessions close, you'll be returned to the main room here, and then we'll just have a sum up and, uh, and close with any final comments, and uh, it would be great to get any feedback. We've got a mechanism for collecting feedback as well. So I'm gonna open all the breakout rooms. You'll see a message pop up on screen inviting you to join. Uh, so we'll see you back here shortly. Uh, welcome back everybody. Uh, I think that's people just coming back into the main room. I think that is everybody. Uh, so I hope you found that uh, breakout session useful. Uh, I'm just going to pop up a slide on screen now because we would love to get your feedback from this event. Um, this is an anonymous feedback platform and if you could go across to menti.com and tap in the code 444971 that will uh, tag in this meeting and you'll be able to give us your feedback, which would be uh, very much appreciated. Uh, it's always difficult, particularly when uh, you've still got a lot of people working from home in unusual circumstances. Um, it's always difficult trying to uh, get the right level of event, the length of the session and so on. Uh, everybody's obviously busy. Uh, and of course, most people may even have been uh, planning a summer holiday at this point as well. So, uh, so we really appreciate you uh, joining us today. But if you could leave us your feedback, that would be uh, very much appreciated. Like I say, just go to menti.com 444971 is the code to tap in and you'll be able to leave us your feedback. Uh, so that really sums up today's session. Uh, I will just put on uh, Ruth's contact details and uh, hand across to you, Ruth, just for any uh, final words. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, just a few sort of quick thank yous from me, um, obviously, to our speakers for taking the time to come and present, um, the facilitators from across the collaborating regions who've taken part in the um, some of the breakout sessions and of course all of you for joining so thank you very much hopefully you found it really useful and interesting and as you can see on the slide now if there was anything um, either specific feedback about the event or some points that you want to raise about the UK regional collaboration that you didn't quite have a chance to get across in a in a breakout session I'd be delighted to hear from you 
Um, but thank you very much um, and um, hopefully see you at future events. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, final words from me, just on behalf of uh, Britain's Energy Coast Business Cluster. There are plenty of members within the cluster who may well be able to help you as you look to return to work and plan how you will approach this new environment that we now face. So whether that's furniture, equipment, screens, hand dispensers, PPE, signage or safety supplies, as well as professional services such as legal and HR advice, financial and health and safety support as well. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us. Uh, again, my thanks to, uh, to those partners on today's event, the East of England Energy Group, Nuclear Southwest, Nuclear, uh, sorry, the Northern Nuclear Alliance, Wales Nuclear Forum and the Northwest Nuclear Arc. That closes today's session. As I said earlier, the, uh, the meeting will be posted to YouTube over the next couple of days and uh, I wish you well. Enjoy the rest of your day. Stay safe and hopefully we'll see you at another event. Thanks very much. Bye bye.